Now let's start off with a little brainstorm. And you can think of your responses. Remember, you can and set, send those responses in through the various um, social media platforms on which we are engaged. So here's our first brainstorm for today. What comes to your mind when you hear the word contract? All right, think about the question and remember you can send those, send those answers in. Okay, so a contract, we say it is a, a legally binding agreement. And it's an agreement between two or more parties whereby something is done or promised to be done or given or promised to be given. So we say a contract is legally binding. So it's an agreement that is enforceable by law. Therefore, um, all parties in the contract have a legal obligation to honor their parts of the contract. And in contracts, you will hear of the reference to various parties. We have the reference to one party we call an offerer and another party we call offeree. So by the term offerer, you know that that's the person who would have made an offer and the offeree is the person who have accepted that offer. So let us look at two terms that are often confused. So in looking at contracts, it is very important that we do not confuse the concepts of an agreement with the concept of, an, of a contract because an agreement is just a mutually exchanged promise while a contract is a promise that is legally binding. It's an agreement that is legally binding and it has um, precedence in court if it is that it reaches that far. So an agreement is just something that we um, come to, we have made a, a mutual decision on, but a contract is an agreement that is enforceable by law. Okay, so as we get um, closer to our first objective, or second objective rather, we're going to be breaking down the two types of contracts. Now, there are other types of contracts, but we're focusing on just these two today as these are required by the, the syllabus. So the two types of contracts that we should be focusing on today are the simple contracts and the specialty contract. So we're going to start off by breaking down what a simple contract is. And this contract of course would sound a little um, less complicated than that of a specialty contract as the word suggests a simple contract therefore a simple contract is an oral or written agreement um, enforceable by law of course that it, it does not require a printed copy of the contract nor does it require a copy that is embossed or sealed so a simple contract, we say that it's, and it's key to note this, it can be co communicated orally or it can be written and um, it can be whether oral or written. So there are certain things that we consider when we talk about um, simple contracts and why a contract is referred to as a simple contract. So these are the things we consider. First and foremost, the first characteristic of a simple contract is that it has uh, the basic um, principles or elements that makes it um, vital. And without these basic elements, it's just an agreement. So we're going to be breaking down these characteristics of a simple contract. And uh, as we said earlier, if any of these seven basic characteristics are missing, it is just a simple agreement and not a contract. So let's look at what these are. In order for something to be considered to be a contract, we must have an offer made in the first place. And just by context clues, you, you should have an idea of what an offer is. So an offer must be made first at the initial stage of that um, starting of our contract or simple contract. Our second characteristics is an acceptance. So then we have a chain reaction happening there. We have an offer made and followed by an acceptance of that offer. We also must have a consideration, something for something, right? All right, so we'll talk about that when we get to consideration. 
capacity of the parties. Hmm. I wonder if we have any clue as to what that might mean. Legality of the subject matter. If you think about this term, you might have some ideas running through your mind right now, but we'll look at this one too. The legality of the matter on which we have engaged in a contract um, about. Possibility and uh, genuineness of the parties or in may, you may hear the term good faith being expressed um, in relation to genuineness of the parties. So we're going to break down each characteristic of our simple contract today. And we're going to be looking at some things that we often confuse um, with some of these characteristics. So, And we're going to break these down so that we're absolutely clear on what these characteristics involve. So let's get started with an offer. What is an offer? So we say an offer is basically a bid. It's a proposal that is made by one person to another. And for something to be considered to be a good offer, it must be specific and clear so that the offer, the offer, the offeree is actually um, understanding what is it that you are, you're offering. It must be expressed and it can also be implied. And it can only be withdrawn before an acceptance by an offeree is, is, is made. So these are the conditions of offer. It must be specific and clear. Um, it can be expressed or implied. And it can only be withdrawn. You can forfeit it before the acceptance is made by an offeree. Okay, so let's look at an example of an offer. Um, so here we have somebody lost their awesome pet and they're giving a reward of $1,000. And uh, even though this is an advertisement, and I'll come back to this, even though this is an advertisement made, it is considered to be an offer. And I'll tell you why um, as we progress. So here we have Chucky is lost, Choo Choo. So our friend ha lost her awesome choo-choo and uh, we know that it's a bare-faced Pomeranian and uh, the address and the, the time at which it was um, lost and the contact information. But most important is the reward being a part of the offer. All right. So let's look at uh, terminology that we sometimes confuse with an offer. So you might have heard of the concept, an invitation to treat. And an invitation to treat is uh, not an offer. And we're going to see, look at why is it that we say an invitation to treat is different from that of an offer. First and foremost, an offer, we must know the definition. An offer is a bid or a proposal made by one person to another. All right, let's look at what the invitation to treat says. An invitation to treat is an invitation to make an offer. So you're inviting someone to come in and make an offer. Um, it is intended to persuade someone to make an offer. It's not the offer. So an invitation to treat, let's look at some examples of um, cases in which we may have invitations to treat that we may mistake um, for an offer. So. An example of an invitation to treat is if you have goods displayed on your shelves, like the shop owner, um, the shop owners are just inviting persons to come in and make an offer. And the buyer enters and makes an offer on a, on a good or service. So a display as well in shop windows, that's an invitation. You're being invited into that store to make an offer. A notice of goods being offered for auction is another example of an invitation to treat. You know, you've seen those announcements in the, in the newspaper um, inviting people to show up at an auction, especially like for motor vehicles and, as an example. Um, if we have sale of motor vehicles via an auction, the notice of goods being offered in the auction is an invitation. You're inviting um, people to come in and make offers. An advertisement, advertisement in general are invitations to treat and they're not offers. 
However, there's a little exception to the rule. Do you realize I showed you uh, an, an advertisement just now? And that is the exception to the rule. Let's look at it. So our exception to the rule says that advertisements of rewards are offers. So even though we say an advertisement is really an invitation to treat, an advertisement that advertises a reward is actually an offer. So if you are withdrawing such an offer, it must be given the same level of pub publicity as the offer you had made and in order for it to be effective. And uh, you can refer to the case, um, Carlyle versus Carbolic Smoke Ball Company, 1892. So this is a perfect example of um, where an advertisement for a reward is a, a, an example of an offer, not an invitation to treat. Okay, so, so far we have just ticked off one of our, our characteristics of a, of a simple contract, and it is an offer, right? Now we're moving on to an acceptance. So, of course, for a contract to really be um, formed, we have somebody, somebody making an offer, and in return, someone accepting. So we have the offerer making an offer and then we have the offeree accepting. So this is the willingness to be bound by an offer. And the general rule is that an acceptance must be communicated. The offerer must know that you have accepted this offer and it can be done either through a verbal statement, conduct or a written statement. Now, here are some few rules that really guide us in, accept, in acceptance of offers. An acceptance must be made in the manner stated by the offerer. So if it is that um, an offer was made, where, whenever you express your acceptance, it must be done so in the manner stated by the offerer. And if there's no specific manner stated, then you may, the offeree may use the quickest means possible. Here is our second rule related to acceptance. So we say an offer must be accepted within a stipulated period of time. And if no time period is, is stated, it must be done within a reasonable um, time period. And the third rule that we'll be um, browsing through today is an acceptance made through the post is actually effective once the letter is posted. So if it is that you are accepting um, an offer, you can do so through the post. And once it is that you have made that posting of your acceptance, um, it is actually considered to be um, valid, a valid acceptance of an offer. Okay, now let's look at consideration. Now consideration, some is what we may term um, as something for something. And of course, there are more accurate or more on-point legal um, definitions of this, this term. So a consideration is where the parties benefit. So these are benefits that are agreed upon by both parties. So what will you benefit? In exchange, what, will I, what benefit will I reap from our, our contract? So each party must get a benefit and each may suffer a detriment. So basically, one person is giving up something in, in aid of getting something else and vice versa. All right. And according to Thomas versus Thomas 1842, consideration must be something of value in the eyes of the law. So it's the thing of value that we trade within a contract. Now we have the fourth um, element of a simple contract and this element stipulates that it's the capacity of the parties so all parties in a contract must be legally able to do so now i want you to think of anyone do you know of anyone who may not have the capacity to enter into a contract it says all parties in a contract must be legally capable to do so like, think of anyone that, you, that may not be legal, legally capable to really enter into a contract. If you say minors, you're correct. And like, 
people of unsound mind or we may have uh, um, people who are drunk, right? So, or intoxicated otherwise. So the following persons are considered to be incompetent to make a valid contract. People who are under the influence, um, people who are insane, minors, and uh, aliens. And the aliens um, co concept is uh, specific, especially to foreign nationals under certain circumstances, like if it is that two countries are at war, there is some stipulation about um, the aliens of, the, of another um, country, that the, con the the two countries are at war, there may, may be some conflict of contracts um, as it relates, relates to capacity of the parties. Okay, then we have legality of the subject matter. Now, I'm sure you know that we cannot get into contracts about um, illegal substances. So you cannot sign a contract to, let's say, um, carry some illegal guns or move some drugs one person to another and if there is no um if there's no carrying out of that contract by one party you i mean you cannot really take that to court because it's illegal what you're doing is illegal therefore we can't enter into contracts um legally when the subject matter is of anything illegal so whatever we agree upon it must be um legally binding it must be something that is not illegal so all, at all times when parties enter into contracts, they must ensure that these contracts conform to the law as well. So if a contract involves any illegal acts, it is deemed to promote civil wrongs, crime or immorality, and becomes illegal or void. Possibility. Now, the concept of possibility means that the parties in a contract must be in a position to deliver the requirements of the contract. So whatever is agreed upon, it must be that um, the consideration, whatever the benefit is, whatever the terms of the contract um, are, it, there must exist the possibility of those um, agreements being, being, being met. Now, as it relates to possibility, we have cases where there are scenarios of impossibility that might take place, especially where we have unforeseen circumstances. So sometimes impossibility takes place in a contract where it interferes with the possibility of meetings and meeting of obligations of the contract. And let's look at an example of this. A good example of this is if parties enter into a contract to rent a building for an event, and the building is destroyed by fire before the time of the event. The party responsible for the part of the contract that deals with the renting can use the best possible method to fulfill his part of the contract. For example, finding another venue to rent the next, um, to rent the next party. So there are cases of impossibility, but whatever is agreed upon, there must be a possibility of uh, um, those terms being um, fulfilled. Okay, we also have genuineness of the parties and this is also referred to as good faith. Now, good faith is really, it involves no coercion and all persons who enter into the contract must do so at their own free will. So people cannot be forced um, to or should not be forced to enter into contracts. Um, there should be no coercion in a contract and all parties must enter at their own free will. Therefore, threat and persuasion should not be um, involved. And the genuineness of the parties is, I think that is our final, uh, our final element of a simple contract. So today we looked at, so far, we looked at um, seven elements of uh, a simple contract. We say that we had to have an offer, just a few of them, an offer and acceptance. Can you think of any other? Yes, well, genuineness of the parties. We have legality, possibility, consideration. All right, so these are some of the um, criteria that uh, a simple contract 
should really uh, meet. Now, remember when we started, we said that we had another type of contract? Yes, and that contract is a specialty contract. Now, if you remember when we started, we said that a simple contract, it doesn't need to be something written. It can be written, but it can be something that is expressed orally. No, um, a simple contract, it can be expressed um, orally and it can be written. However, with a specialty contract, let's look at why we refer to it as a specialty contract. A specialty contract is formal, it's a more formal agreement and it must be done in writing. Now, it is also called a contract, a contract under seal or deeds and they have three characteristics. So let's look at what makes the specialty contract different from that of uh, a simple contract. So with the specialty contract, the document must be signed. So it's documented first and foremost. It's not something that is expressed um, orally. It's documented and it's signed by all parties involved. So with the specialty contract, you may hear the term, it must be signed, sealed and delivered, right? So we have the signing that must take place. It is sealed using a printed, pasted or embossed seal. And it must be delivered to all the parties of the contract. They must all receive a copy. So a specialty contract, if it is sometimes when you um, engage in a contract of employment, it may mean that you have your employer signing, you, you signing, and it is stamped by um, your, the, 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 the offerer who have actually uh, made that offer. All right, so we're gonna get started with our challenge. Now, with our challenge today, we have about, about four questions and we're gonna really go through some multiple choice questions to really help us to prepare a little bit better um, for our upcoming e exams. So let's start with our first challenge for today. And I know that you are able to do this, so let's look at what the question requires. So it says, which of the following describes an essential feature of a valid contract? So is it A, the offer has been communicated to the offeree? Is it B, a counter offer has been made by the offerer, offeree of the offer? Um, the offer has been accepted by the offeree? Or the offer has been made in, in writing by the offerer? Now, for this question, I know that um, the one element of the contract is that an offer must be made, but the closest answer, let's see, is uh, C, where an acceptance is made. So it says that an offer, so C stipulates that an offer was made and there was an acceptance also. So um, C would be the, the most accurate response to this question. Let's see if we can go through one more question. So the next question says, consideration. Remember what we said? Something for something. All right, so consideration is an essential element in the formation of a valid contract. And this may be defined as, is it A, the need for fairness in the contract? Is it B, the intention of the parties to be legally bound? Is it C, a balance in the terms of agreement? Or is it D, the bargain element of the contract. Okay, I'm not going to give you this answer just yet. I want you to think about this one and you can text your answers in. So, more schools not out after the break. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. 
Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. COVID-19 tip. Protect yourself and others from getting sick by washing your hands after coughing or sneezing when caring for the sick before, during and after you prepare food before eating, after toilet use, when hands are visibly dirty, and after handling animals or animal waste. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit your doctor or the nearest health center and share your travel history. The flu and coronavirus can kill. Let's protect each other. A message from the Ministry of Health. Welcome back to Schools Not Out, your daily classroom for CSEC and CAPE subjects. We're talking multiple choice in CSEC POB today. And uh, before the break, we started looking at this particular question. Now, I know that some of you are certain that you have the answer. All right. So we said that just to review for those who might have missed the question, we said that consideration is an essential element in the formation of a valid contract. And it may be identified as, is it A, the need for fairness in the contract? Is it B, the intention of the parties to be legally bound? Um, is it a balance in the terms of agreement, which is C? Or is it D, the bargain element of the contract? All right. So the answer is the bargain element of the contract. What is it that you have agreed up to, to give in exchange for um, what benefit that I will offer? All right. So then we have our next question. Now, our next question states, what is the status of items displayed on supermarket shelves? Hmm. Remember now, um, when we started, we spoke about the first characteristic of simple, con uh, simple contracts. And we said that there's something that must not be considered to be an offer. So if you remember that um, little discussion we had, you should have the answer to this question. So it says, what is the status of the items displayed on the supermarket shelves? Is it that there are offers, which is A? Is it B, there are in invitations to treat? Is it C, there are acceptances? Or is it D, an advertisement? So the display of uh, goods on a supermarket shelf is considered to be, if you said B, you're correct, good job. So um, B, would be would make it it's an invitation to treat and remember that we looked at some of the other conditions under which we had invitations to treat yes like um goods in a display window as well and advertisements with the exception that we mentioned all right so here we have another challenge let's see if we can get this one so look at the picture take a little while to examine the picture it starts out it says uh, public auction Every second Saturday at 9 a.m., hundreds of vehicles, equipment, and recreation, um, recreational, free admission, free registration, free parking. All right, so the big heading at the top says public auction. So here's our question. It says the image displayed is an example of what element of contracts, of course? Is it that it's a contract? Is it an offer? Is it an acceptance? Or is it an invitation to treat? Think about this question. Now, let's see what our answer is. 
if you said D, an invitation to treat as well, you are correct. So, so far we have looked at two questions that the answers are invitations um, to treat. Okay, and here is our final question for today before we do our little recap. So, the final question says, can the postal rule be applied to instantaneous methods of communication? Now, before we look at the answer to this question, let's, let's run through what does the postal rule say again? Remember what it says? It says that if it is that an acceptance is um, being made through the mail, it is uh, enforceable once it is that it hits um, the, the postal um, office. So once it is that you've mailed out that acceptance, it is enforceable. Now, um, and that is if the condition of the offer is open to, to that type of, of acceptance. Now, there are instantaneous methods um, through which we can really communicate acceptance. It can be through um, a phone call. It can be through an email or any other electronic means of communication, right? Um, but the postal rule, as we explained just now, so it says, can the postal rule be applied to instantaneous methods of communication? And that is a no. We do not apply the postal rule because um, the postal rule says that once the acceptance is mailed, it is enforceable. However, um, with instantaneous methods, like um, you have to really wait until the offerer actually receives your email um, for you to really be considered to have uh, really made your, your agreement or communicated your agreement. If it's a phone call, which is another instantaneous method, the acceptance is not um, communicated until, um, or it's not really set to be in motion until that um, phone call takes place. So the instantaneous method um, methods really are separate from the postal rule. Now, let us do a little recap. For today, our objectives that we covered, we defined the concept of, of contract, and we said that a contract is a legally binding agreement between two or more parties, remember? Right, and uh, we actually looked at the differences between a just a mere agreement and that of a contract. We said that an agreement is uh, um, something that is mutual, it's a mutual, um, you know, promise that we've made to each other. Unlike a contract, yes, it's a promise, it's an agreement that is made with a little something else because it has, to, and that little something else, we call it um, the, the legal aspect of it. It must be enforceable by law. All right, then we looked at the different types of contracts. Can you name the two types of contracts that we looked at today? And remember that they're more than it's more than just those two but because the syllabus really confines us to those two we looked at those all right if you said simple contract or specialty contract yes you are correct so those are the two contracts that we looked at now i wonder if you're able to distinguish between the two of them remember that we said that simple contracts um yes they're legally binding um as they're referred to as contracts however the difference is that this, with a with simple contract, we said, it is uh, something that can be communicated orally or it can be written, right? And we said that there are seven elements of uh, the um, simple contract, which we'll look at um, soon. And the specialty contract, however, as opposed to the simple contract, it must be documented. It must be in writing. Um, it is... Uh, something that has to be signed by the parties involved and it must be sealed as well and delivered. So we say the specialty contract is something that has to be signed, sealed and delivered. And the delivered aspect of it is where all the parties of the contract must have a copy of that document. We also looked at the characteristics of uh, um, our simple contract. Remember what they are? I know you can at least, you can name at least four. All right, so we say that they are offer, 
we have acceptance so after an offer is made we have an acceptance that is um made after and we sometimes we have counter offers that until an, an agreement is is signed so we have an offer an acceptance we have consideration something that we give up um the benefit that each party really reap from this process we also have legality is the matter that we agree upon a legal um a legal concept is it something that is legal um are all the 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 legal processes um followed are all the good processes followed um we also have a possibility so whatever is agreed upon it must be something that is uh, possible um we also have genuineness of the parties and uh, in other words we call that good faith and we must have capacity of the parties as well so those are the seven um, basic principles of our simple contract. Remember what um, the capacity of the parties involve? People who are drunk, people who are intoxicated, um, cannot enter into, into, into contracts. People who are, um, people should not be coerced into entering into contracts. So when we talk about co um, capacity of the parties, those who enter into contracts must be able to do so legally. Minors are not able to do so um, either. So we also looked at the description of the characteristics of our specialty contract and we mentioned them. It, the specialty contract must be um, signed, sealed and delivered. And uh, when we talk about uh, the distinction between an offer, we also spoke about the distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat. Can you, rem can you relate um, what we discussed today? regarding an offer and an invitation to treat? Well, we say that with an invitation to treat, we are inviting someone to make an offer. Can you remember some of, some of the examples of invitations to treat? Yes, like uh, goods that are on the shelf, um, goods that are in the showcase of businesses and advertisements with the exception of, uh, um, of advertisements that involve promising a reward. So we call that um, an offer. Okay, now, if it is that you're able to distinguish between an offer and an invitation to treat, good job. All right, so that's all for today. Today, I hope that you were enlightened of, um, about contracts and there's far, far more that we could discuss. Um, you can check out the, the content in the CSEC syllabus and see where do we go next after we look at the the various characteristics of contracts. Okay, now you can watch a repeat of today's lesson on JNN later at 4 p.m. and in Schools Not Out highlights on Saturday between 1 and 4 p.m. It also will be on video on demand on television on onespotmedia.com. Until next time, take care everyone. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much. For Reduce your risk of viral illnesses like the flu and coronavirus. Wash your hands frequently with soap and water. Cover your nose and mouth when coughing with a tissue and dispose of it. Avoid close contact with anyone with a cold or flu-like symptoms. If you become ill, please visit...